My name is Scott Tucker. Since 2004, I have traveled the globe in search of adventure, culture, and wildlife. And after producing 100 short documentaries and broadcasting them across the entire U.S., it's finally dawned on me. This must be too good for mainstream media. I don't take vacations. This is not a hobby. We are totally out of the box. Okay, gang, uh, I'm a little nervous, okay? I haven't done this in quite some time. I lost my sidekick, Race August Tucker has gone to bed. We are now on our way to what I believe to be the ringer. It's the ringer spot. I can't show you um, exactly where we're going. It's kind of sacrilegious there in the amphibian reptile world to give away your spot. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off in another moment and then oh geez I forgot my seatbelt. Okay, there we go. Then I promise we'll sign back on once we get to the location. So we're, we're only like five minutes away. Um, so so just stay tuned, just to sit tight. Give me a few more minutes. But we got ourselves an absolute delightful, I think, uh, opportunity to see some amphibians in the process of amplexus, which is this thing... Uh, that scientists have decided it, uh, to, to basically transfer the word copulation into a whole nother word. So, you know, the uh, male uh, spotted salamander will basically um, drop a spermatophore, a white gelatinous uh, packet of sperm with his genetic information. The female will then intake it into her cloaca and then uh, shortly thereafter, she basically disperses her eggs, which have been fertilized by that spermatophore. So right now it's possible that only the males have dropped spermatophores. It's also equally possible that the females uh, are not even in the vernal pool. So we're, we're taking a long shot. Okay, I gotta sign off now. I'll be back shortly. Stick with us. Okay. Uh, I haven't seen any salamanders yet, okay? But I have a sneaking suspicion that if I just get my camera in the housing, I don't know, I think I could potentially be able to get this thing down and perhaps show you some stuff that's happening. The key thing right now is to just get it in the water. And I'm gonna have to shut my mouth and back, but uh, I'm gonna get this baby open, I swear I will. Come on, you can do this, Scotty. You're all by yourself. Come on, you can do it. I can do this. I'm just, I gotta get this thing open. Remember, in order to be able to open and shut these, you gotta be able to lock them good. Oh, there it is. There's a little lock mechanism there, I think. There it is. You gotta be able to. You gotta be able to. Ah, I got it. Okay, I got it. Okay, Flying there we go. It in. I'm gonna. Say a prayer, we can stay live with you guys. I don't even know if I can, we're gonna try. Here we go, we're in. Okay, we're in. Anybody with experience using underwater video or camera equipment, bubbles are the sound of death. She took on water. Oh, shoot. I think she took on water. Oh man, she's not supposed to get wet. Okay, guys, I'm back in the uh, back of the car. That was uh, I par for the course. Okay, I'm trying to wing this thing together. I'm trying to put it together. I'm all excited. I found this underwater housing. I just I never even tested it. Cardinal sin number one: never put your camera in an underwater housing. Unless you've tested it first, I just, I never in a million years, this thing was so hard to open and so hard to close. Maybe I've got to somehow lubricate the gasket or some crazy thing. Maybe the gasket wasn't right. I, I just, I can't take a chance with my phone. I don't want it to, uh, 
Believe it or not, the phone's fine. Even though the thing started flooding, I noticed it started flooding. I saw all the bubbles coming up. When you see bubbles coming up from your underwater camera housing, you know there is a problem. You got, you can't do that. So uh, long story short, we pulled it out. Listen, I think this is going to wrap it up. Sunday night, I made a commitment. Um, on Sunday night, I'm done. Uh, tomorrow we're back to work. So, uh, I'm going to try to compile all this and put it. Who's that? I swear to God, I just, I just had this, I call them, uh, ideations that somebody was about to attack me. I'm by myself. It's dark. I'm out in the, in the woods. Somebody could easily take a, a, a small crowbar and crack it through the windshield, but. It was just an ideation. Okay, so long story short, um, I am going to be Troy. I'm serious. I had those thoughts, okay? Troy, we grew up together. Troy Stevens, we grew up together. You know what could happen. Quaint little village town, Madison and Gilvin. Oh, everything's so happy. Bang! Bang! So listen, we're going to get to the wildlife. I swear to you, you guys have been really patient you know, the last few shows has been, here's some shark teeth from 10 million years ago, and here's a couple snakes from last year, but we're going to find some stuff in the here and now. That's my goal. We're going to save some salamanders. We're going to save some frogs. We're also going to get right in there. We're going to watch them doing it. I'm not kidding you. We're going to watch it. You're going to flip. It's 35 degrees. Okay, not a lot happening. One wood frog. We're like, Wah. One wood frog. That's all you can do. All right, that's enough from me. I swear to it. For this time, uh, signing off, Expedition Earth, unless something crazy happens, that's it. And as you can expect, something crazy happened. We went to Vermont. Tucker Expedition Earth. I've finally made my way back up to Vermont. We're in the Green Mountains. On a very popular ski slope. And I'm, I'm doing some research in homo sapien behavior. It appears that people are absolutely bonkers and obsessed with taking a manual machine up to the top of a hill and then strapping on these amazing... Uh, I suppose frictionless slider devices on the bottom of their feet. And then they go wee down the hill, wee down the hill. It's just amazing how many people will spend perhaps, you know, I don't know, $5,000 a year just to go up and down, up and down and go wee down the hill, wee down the hill. Stick with us. We got our first signs of life here. What do we have? We got a, what looks to be like a, that looks to be like a rabbit right there. Rabbits. So now it's March 24th, the Green Mountains in Vermont. You start to notice bears begin to start rustling around with moms with the cubs. But this is it, you can't see this on the ski slopes yet. You actually have to get off the slopes and into the, the woods a bit. You'll see a tremendous amount of activity. Anyways, we're just starting to get warmed up here. If you're just joining us, we're hijacking the middle of the amphibian breeding migration in Southern Connecticut with a quick trip up to the Green Mountains in Vermont where we can start to spy on some of these creatures that are probably desperate, really searching for food, and maybe even, might even find a sighting of a black bear. Stick with us. I think the most confusing thing about climate change and all this conversation about global warming and 
you know, everybody's pointing to all the contrary evidence is that, look, overall on this planet right now, we're sensing with all of our devices and all the amazing discoveries that are being made is that globally we're warming up and it, the evidence is in the ice caps. In New England, it's extremely difficult to understand because you still get a winter every year. But that doesn't mean anything. When a polar vortex swings into this anomaly wobble and screws up the systems, you get extremes, which you're seeing here uh, in ways we've never seen before. Massive flooding right now in the, out in the west. You're going to see all this snow melting. So... Again, if you're going to be a doubter and you're not going to look at the science, of course, just, you know, click me off. But take a look at some of the research. It's evident. The glaciers are melting at a rapid pace. There's no denying that. Uh, what we need to do is to understand what's happening and change our impact if we have the ability to do it. I say it starts with birth control. For my entire life, the Green Mountains have always been the picture and the epitome of Vermont, the beauty of Vermont. And I'm up here looking out from this amazing chalet overlooking the slopes and I look, then I look behind the slopes and I think to myself, we have carved out more of this amazing habitat to park and for everyone to have individual kitchens and bathrooms, actually 2.5 bathrooms and roadways to get to these slopes, probably than we have to actually carve out and remove all the trees to create the slopes for skiers. And again, there is no good, there is no bad, but at some point you gotta just stop and take a look is how many acres have we gobbled up and completely stripped of what was once here. Eventually, you know, a developer would come in here and say, geez, you know, that's a beautiful spot right there. Well, how about this one? How about that one? Next thing you know, you come back here eight, nine, ten years later, you don't see it. It's so slow. But the evolution of our impact on the green mountains in Vermont is, it's unthinkable when you take a look as to what's happening. And... I just hope people in Vermont will take a good look at protecting as much open space as they can now before they look back and regret it. Our lifespans are only 85 years old. As a species, we've been around for many, many thousand. So how are you going to really get your mind around? You're only looking at your own 80 years, 90 years. That's all you care about. How much wealth can you accumulate? You don't care about the other 200 years, 500 years beyond. These slopes in the habitat are gone forever. So we gotta pay attention. Why is it that people are obsessed with skiing and people come here and spend thousands and thousands? What is it about skiing that absolutely captivates and just magnetizes homo sapiens to come here? Gotta hit the, get the speed, get the adrenaline going, hanging out with the boys, you know. So you're a snowboarder. Oh yeah. And uh, I, I never, I didn't grow up doing that. I'm a little bit uh, behind those times. But so snowboarding, did you try skiing? Was it no. different? No, never, I just went right did. for snowboarding. Yeah. Fantastic. You skateboarded earlier. Okay, skateboarding. Okay, cool. Well, I'm, I'm gonna let you go. But so speed is the key. You like to, you like that feeling of speed. Yeah. Total control, just catching the edge, ripping it. Catching the edge and ripping it. Okay, I got it. I'm doing, I'm trying to do some scientific research. I really appreciate it. Best of luck, my friend. Not that fast, really.
the emotion of sliding down. Euphoria. <laughs> okay, euphoria, okay. There. So again, I'm just trying to get some basic footage and understanding. No one probably knows it better than you. Why are people here? You said something about over and over again. Why are they here over and over again? I mean, to me, I think the just the views and how people ride. You know, they they just they like it. You know, I, don't I, worry. I can't really explain it for them. You keep I'm trying going. to get my mind around why are people here? Why are why is skiing so powerful? Can I just ask you a quick question on video so I can use it for the research? Why? What is your name? Uh, my name is Will Silveria. Will Silveria, are you from this area? Uh, no, I'm actually from Rhode Island. Rhode Island, so you traveled two hours, three hours? About three hours. Will, why are people here? It's the people, man. It's the people. I mean, it's the people. The people here are very good. Uh, they're very helpful. It's a big mountain. It's a lot of fun to go skiing. I see. So, long story short is, it's the people. It's the people. People are wonderful. But why are you so amazed? Obviously, you could ski anywhere um but why do you ski it's a big investment um because you know i like the feeling of going fast and it's a really nice view out here there's just you know a lot of um it's not something that you can really do around there's something this big and you just can't really find anything like it down there thank you will so listen, I've just compiled the research. I think I have a good handle on what's happening. Thomas has been very generous as he's waiting to take skis. Yes, of course. And uh, Thomas and I have kind of nailed it. Um, I'm gonna try to just do this while we're talking because time is short. Um, skiers are getting an endorphin rush, which is a euphoric type of thing. Um, let's face it, 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 it's endorphins. You're getting high. Now, listen, there's all kinds of bad connotations with getting high, but you're getting high with the endorphin rush. Adrenaline uh, causes these emotions to occur. So, listen, there's all kinds of views about that phrase, getting high, but you're here getting high. The endorphin rush is providing the chemical cocktail for you to get stoned. So, we've, there we go. We got it. If you have any questions, Expedition Earth, I am now kind of diving into anthropology and the anthropological look at why people ski. This is Expedition Earth. Stick with Look at this. Look at this. Look at them all. Look at them all. I've never seen so many people completely packed in like sardines. I mean, this is crazy. Oh, look at this, it's even more. Look at this. Adrenaline. The adrenaline. Oh my God. This is insane, look at this guy. This is the result of the power of obtaining the adrenaline rush, the euphoric feeling of almost losing control, maintaining control or losing control. And subsequently, the chemical cocktail that you then obtain, that, that euphoric feeling, which is in essence, the same thing you're getting from an opiate, except you're spending money on this one and you're not ending up well, wait a minute, you are ending up addicted, uh, I would say, since people come back here over and over and over again. Until you get your mind and your body and your soul around the nature of addiction, you're really not going to understand what's happening here. But this is addiction at its best. It's the scenery. Hey, you can go anywhere for the scenery. Uh, the people, you can go anywhere for the people. I'm going to say speed, which has been mentioned at least five or six times, is the huge fascination here and the attraction is the chemical cocktail of the endorphin rush. 
of the speed. Speed is the factor. Okay, as promised, we're back. And this time, we're gonna actually come through. I'm in the identical spot I was one week ago tonight here in Madison, Connecticut, except this time I've already seen wood frogs here inside this vernal pool. And I just saw my first cluster of wood frog eggs. Still no spotted salamanders, but I know what I'm looking at, folks, and check this out. Before we go underwater, I'm gonna show you from up above what wood frog eggs look like. Check this out right here. Okay, I'm gonna flip it around. I mean, it, it's right there. That is wood, those are wood frog eggs. I am 99.9% .9 positive in the dark here, but they are. And I'm right in here, uh, clear as day. There was a couple of them. But once I turn the light on, they're gone. They do not like any kind of uh, activity to screw with them. Before we get the camera in the water, underwater housing, let me try, try to get a little bit of a closer up because now I'm a little bit worried that what I th thought I just showed you as being wood frog eggs, they have a, just a resemblance of the spotted salamander. And I'm not exactly positive. So please, uh, bear with me for one second. I'm going to put this camera back in my hands. I'm going to try to fish him in a little bit closer. Uh, and I'm going to put the headlight on my head. So just two seconds. Ready? Okay, we're going to bring him in a little bit closer. Yes, that's better. Look at those eggs right there. Do you believe this? I can, I can get him just a little bit closer. Of course, I'm holding my camera above the darn. Put him in. Oh, there you go. Right there. Look at that. We'll have to analyze the footage later. But I am worried now that these are spotted eggs. It's not a worry, actually. We have officially got our first amphibian egg cluster of 2019. Today is March 24th, Madison, Connecticut. Very exciting. Notice these are on a branch. Obviously, I'm holding the branch just gently. So uh, they're submerged, not really deep enough, for, in, in my opinion. Um, I would think that they would be deeper. You know, uh, let's face it, if there's no rain for seven, eight, nine days, these things will be exposed to the elements and the, the eggs will die. So whoever laid those eggs took a little bit of a risk. They would normally want to be at least eight inches below the surface so they would survive until hatch out. Okay, we're gonna go underwater with this sucker. Do this. Get my boots and try not to get make too much of a disaster. Here's the underwater housing and everything, just like it was last time. Except this time we actually went out and bought the right one for the, for the camera, so. Okay, we're gonna get a little, a little freaky here in a moment because you're not gonna hear a damn word I say, so. Stay with us. I'm going to only go in for a couple minutes. It'll be silent and then, and then I'll, I promise I'll, I'll get you back, okay? Finally, we get the camera underwater and we're inside the amphibian world, the aquatic world. But the only thing I can see is leaf litter. I can't find anybody breeding. Folks, I promise we'll come through, but at this point, we're out of time. Raise. Raise. Raise, it's time for Facebook Live. Honey. Honey, I need you. Raise. Honey, I, I need you. I'm afraid we have a, uh, a problem. Uh, my sidekick is unavailable. He's actually sleeping. And we have a secondary problem. Uh, 
quite honestly, there's no rain. And if there's no rain, that means there's no amphibians moving. The rain does not come as predicted. Um, Facebook Live. Hey. Hey.